Hello, good evening. Am I audible? I think I need, I need to get some kind of a clue. Okay, good, fantastic. I'm, I'm, I'm so glad that uh, so many people could, uh, could find some time to attend uh, today's webinar. And the uh, world is going through a difficult uh, pace, never before and never after. And this is the common scene which we see in day-to-day -day life, nothing else more than this. We already spent about three months or four months, and we don't know how long we may have to be like this. We're all prepared. We're all prepared to be like this for a long time. Uh, today's topic would be uh, uh, essential pediatric dentistry for uh, pediatrics and pediatricians. Uh, my name is Srinivas Namineni. I've been associated with the Rainbow ever since inception. Uh, it's almost, uh, I think, 20 years. I've been practicing pediatric dentistry ever since then. And uh, it was it was a it was a pleasurable journey for me in Rainbow, and uh, it's fantastic uh, being there. I was the president of uh, Indian Society of Pediatric and Preventive Dentistry. I was teaching uh, in mainstream uh, pediatric dental uh, sciences uh, till six seven years ago. Now I'm into full time practice. Greetings from uh, Rainbow Children's Hospital. Uh, uh, it would be a, a very wide scope if I have to cover everything what a pediatrician need to know. So I requested a few of my colleagues uh, to prepare some frequently asked questions where a pediatrician will be asked by the uh, uh, pediatrician will be asked by uh, the patients. So I, I, I thank Dr. Kavita pediatric endocrinologist rainbow hospital Hyder Nagar. she jotted down few questions and uh, she she spoke around with people and uh, she got few more questions and uh, so i have about few questions about 10 to 15 questions which i'm going to answer i think that will make your life comfortable to face a patient when they come with uh, some kind of a dental problem in your day-to-day -day dental office now one of them being when will be the first dental checkup should start that's the most common uh, question we all have in mind. When should we start? The first dental checkup should essentially start before the two therapies. That, that approximately coincides the sixth month of the sixth month of the child before the first two therapies. It's always good to see the child before the two therapies because uh, once the tooth starts, there are few problems. Uh, uh, which involves dental caries will start very early. By the time you realize that uh, the child is coming for the first dental checkup, the child would have already come to you with some kind of a dental issue. So it would be very comfortable and convenient for us to see the child even before the two therapies. What should this first dental checkup should include when these children come to your pediatric practices? I know uh, the well baby checkups, uh, which a pediatrician will do on a day to day basis. Uh, will involve screening of so many health issues, but a small part of it is still uh, involves the teeth and the dentition and the mouth. Now, what should be included in the first dental checkup or the first checkup of the teeth during the well baby checkups? The first one should be what is the erection schedule? Many parents who come with this doubt, when is my child's tooth is going to erupt? So we need to update them about the eruption schedule, which I'm going to touch upon in, in, in later slides. What kind of a feeding care, whether it's breastfeeding or bottle feeding, what exactly is the right way to feed the child as far as dental health is concerned? And how to initiate the dental hygiene for the infant or the baby and how early it should be done? This is what uh, uh, should include. And what kind of uh, care we need to take when we let the child exposed to sugars and how frequently should happen, how frequently should uh, this gentle checkup happen uh, to continue to have a healthy mouth and teeth uh, in the future of the child. So these are the basic uh, structure uh, which include uh, uh, during the first dental checkups. Uh, I would uh, draw your attention to this uh, particular problem, which is called early childhood dental caries. Many of you are familiar with this, but many of us are equally clueless about why did this happen and how to go about, should I treat it or not? This is what we have 
uh, we have uh, in mind. Uh, this is called early childhood dental caries, which is rapidly spreading, which involves multiple teeth in a shortest span of time. The quick pulpal involvement, as uh, many of you would be aware now, once the tooth gets decayed, once it wants a pulp, the, once the pulp gets involved, the pain is going to be so severe and only person who experiences it will know. Without experience, we may not know the intensity of the uh, 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 toothache. So these kids, the tender uh, kids who are going to come, they would have already suffered from severe toothache. They will, they will, they will spend sleepless nights uh, uh, with agony, ruining the mother's and the parents' uh, peace of mind. So this is how the children are going to come. Many of us, when we have this experience, we usually give a painkiller and reassure the parent that uh, this is okay. These are the milk tea. They're going to fall off at some point of time. This is exactly what you're not supposed to be doing. We need to give a little more care and thought about this problem. What kind of a thought, what kind of a care is what we need to know about. The most early childhood dental care is one of the most common dental problem for a toddler. That is, if the child has to report to a dental clinic or a pediatrician for the dental problem, most often it is because of the early childhood dental care is what they suffer from. Suffer from. Now, why does this happen? The early childhood dental caries will have a typical presentation pattern where upper four incisors will get involved first. They start with the discoloration. Slowly, they will start breaking down. Then the fourth tooth from midline, that's called the molar, will start getting affected. And the lower first molars will get affected. This is a very typical pattern of early childhood dental caries. First four incisors will get affected. Then the upper molars will get affected. Then lower first molars will get affected. This basically coincides with the eruption status of the child. Exception is the lower anteriors because lower anteriors are usually pulled in the saliva. So milk which is pulled around the saliva is diluted. It will not have opportunity to ferment where once the fermentation happens, it turns into lactic acid and it will start ravishing the incisors. And this is how the child is going to be presenting if if, it is, if they are left un, un, untreated for a long time. And this is after many agonizing nights and many abscesses, swollen lips, and uh, all sorts of things. So this is one important condition we all need to know about, especially the pediatricians whom uh, the children and the parent approach for the first time. Now, what should a pediatrician's role in identifying and managing this condition? Number one, please do not ignore any change in the color. Most often parents will come with the information that I made my pediatrician aware of this discoloration. My pediatrician actually reassured me that that is okay. And these teeth are going to be falling off and new teeth are going to come. But unfortunately, every milk tooth will fall off whether we want it or not. But these incisors are decayed at one and a half, two years, and the teeth are going to fall off at between six and seven years. So how can we expect the children to be bearing the pain and discomfort and ravishing of the teeth for about five to six years? So we need to pay a little more attention. The first thing what probably what you may have to consider doing is you can consider referring this child to a pediatric dentist as early as possible because uh, early intervention will make uh, things very easy where you can, you can reverse certain conditions of the early childhood dental caries. Once the cavitation happens, then only restoration is the solution. Sometimes these treatments are going to be so painful and so expensive that uh, many people will get put off by by, by the mere expenditure and mere suffering and mere visits. So if we can attend to that very early, the treatment is going to be very simple and easy and inexpensive. Ideally, as the number of teeth come out, the number of night feeding should be advised to stop. That means when the child is being fed about four to five times in the night, I'm talking about in the night, I'm not talking about the daytime. I'm not finding fault with the breastfeeding. I'm trying to find fault with the breastfeeding in the night after sixth month. So as the, as the teeth come out after sixth month, as the number of teeth come out, the number of feedings in the night should, should slowly be reduced. So these are the three important things which you need to keep in mind. And that is how your counseling is going to solve. What else you're going to counsel these children and the parents? 
discourage at will nighttime feedings after first birthday especially while mother and baby are sleeping together we all know the perils of uh, 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 the, the perils of mothers sleeping with the baby and uh, many times even uh, sudden infant death syndrome is also been blamed uh, 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 blamed uh, when the mother and child sleep together on a soft cushion and when the child is being fully covered and which is going to make the child difficult with breathing and uh, that can lead to complications similarly discourage the child sleeping with the mother after the first birthday they should not be sharing the bed but they can share the room the best thing is to put them on a different cot or a swing but not along with the mother moment to start sleeping with the baby the baby will tend to latch onto the nipple and feed many times and there is going to be a continuous stream of milk into the mouth and this milk when it is suckled in the night the milk will remain in the mouth and start fermenting once it starts fermenting it turns into lactic acid lactic acid will start leaching away the calcium from the teeth and that is how the breaking down of the tooth will happen so uh, please don't hesitate to lift the lip lift the lip at the sixth month and you'll know the story lift the lip you just have to lift the lip so that you will know many problems with the child is suffering as far as teeth are concerned and uh, when it comes to the management a pediatric dentist would probably consider restoring a tooth which is damaged so much to to this kind of aesthetics mind you we are not trying to restore the teeth only for the sake of aesthetics if they are rest if they are not restored if they are not attended the trick that disease is going to be spreading so fast once it touches the pulp of the tooth and the tooth is going to be extremely painful and this is how the teeth are going to be extracted if we don't attempt to the uh, treatment initially so these are the teeth which underwent uh, root canals and then probably crowns are being put all these things will involve little effort these children who are at that age may not be able to offer their cooperation to sit and get the treatment done invariably about 60 to 70% of the children will probably need dental treatment under general anesthesia or probably iv sedations which is totally uncalled for and totally unnecessary and totally avoidable so this is where i expect a pediatrician to show little more uh, concern and alert the parents about the dangers of uh, feeding the babies in the night uh in the night when the when the when both mother and the child are sleeping so we are going to learn little more about these things in the first few slides now when to start the brushing and which is the right toothpaste for my child this is the most common question probably asked to us and i'm sure most of us would have been uh asked at uh, these questions uh, uh yeah uh when should you start brushing moment the first tooth comes out you should start brushing that means moment the uh, around 6th month of age the, when the first tooth comes you have to start making an attempt to clean the teeth and how should you clean you should take a clean cotton fuel cloth which is which is sterilized or boiled along with a bottle and wipe it up with the lower teeth wiped up and upper teeth wiped down so this is a good habit to do after every feeding so that the milk doesn't remain on the teeth for long periods of the time and you are going to disrupt the plaque on the tooth which if it is not disrupted will act like a sponge and absorb the milk and hold it against the tooth and which is going to propitiate uh, the, uh, the damaging of the teeth so the best way to start cleaning is to clean the teeth with the clean cotton cloth and at the earliest switch over to silicon finger brushes which are available in most of the stores and use any good make of brush ideally ideally around 1 year and later switch over to a good baby brush so start with cleaning with the cotton cloth at 6 months of age switch over to silicon finger brush at the earliest by the time the child around 8 months to 1 year when they get both central incisors and lateral incisors both up and down you should be able to brush their teeth with the toothbrush instead of trying to brush their teeth like how we brush our teeth it is always good habit to give the brush to the child so that they explore it so that they become more comfortable so that they don't get uncomfortable when you actually put the brush on the bristles on the tooth 
Now, what kind of a toothpaste? Always prefer no fluoride. That means zero fluoride toothpaste to start the brushing with. At about six months till one year, or sometimes only till eight months, you can start using no fluoride or zero fluoride toothpaste and continue this for about two to three months time. And once the child is, is about, about, uh, about eight months to one year, you can switch over to toothpaste with 1000 ppm. This could be a little surprising thing for many pediatricians and for that matter, many dentists too. We are all in the tradition of advising children to be using low fluoride toothpaste where we are worried about child ingesting the toothpaste. Now the concepts have changed. We are expected to advise the toothpaste with high fluoride, which has at least 1000 ppm of fluoride in it, 1000 ppm of fluoride. In India, unfortunately, we don't get high fluoride baby toothpaste, but you do get adult toothpaste, which has 1000 ppm. So please do not hesitate to request the parents to switch over to adult toothpaste instead of children's toothpaste. Children's toothpaste, which has fluoride of about 500 ppm is a liability, is not ideal. It is not going to be helping the child to prevent caries. Once the lactic acid takes away the calcium, you cannot put back the calcium. Only fluoride ions will go occupy the places of calcium and reinforce the teeth. So what child needs is high fluoride toothpaste, where a children's toothpaste may not you offer you that kind of a toothpaste. You can confidently advise children, start with a low fluoride toothpaste, wait for about two to three months time, and you can straight away switch over to adult toothpaste or children's toothpaste, which has about 1000 ppm. And instead of trying to reduce the amount of fluoride in the toothpaste, we advise parents to use toothpaste, which is about a rice grain sized amount of toothpaste to start with, a rice grain sized amount of toothpaste. So at about three or four months time, you can, uh, sorry, after about seven or eight months time, you can switch over from zero fluoride toothpaste to high fluoride toothpaste, but use about rice grain sized amount of toothpaste. By the time the child is about one year, probably you can use half a peanut sized amount of toothpaste and brush at least twice a day, at least twice a day. Now, how, which is the right method to brush the teeth at that point of time till the child is about four years or three years or four years, scrub, 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 just scrub, that's enough. You know, there is no specific technique for it because that is the easiest way for the mother to brush and easiest for the child to learn. So scrub method is ideal for the child less than five years. Now, next question would be, should we allow children to have chocolates and sweets? It is like I going to a cardiologist and ask, dog, can I have, can I have a few pegs of alcohol every day? Uh, uh, cardiologist is going to slap me up. So similarly, it's like, you know, it's not fair to, you know, many parents would ask you, should I allow my child to have chocolates or not? The answer would be in this explanation. You should not be advising any sugar to be added in any form to or any food till two years of age. That includes jaggery, honey or maple syrup or any other sweeteners. I repeat again, do not add any free sugars to the food in any form or to any food till the child is about two years. The easiest way the child is made to eat food is to make things a little sweeter. So once the child starts getting accustomed with the sweet food, they prefer everything to be sweet and they'll start avoiding foods which are not sweet. That is how the children are going to pull you into the trap. They are not going to pull you into the trap. You are not going to pull them into the trap. That is how we are going to be fooled and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, pulled into the trap. There is something called sugar discipline where you need to understand the difference between the quantity of the sugar and how frequent the child is. If I give 10 chocolates each to two children, if we ask the first chocolate, first child to have uh, 10 chocolates in one go, and if, you, if I ask the second child uh, 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 to have 10 chocolates a whole day, it is the second child who is going to have more cavities than the first child. Even if the first child is given only five chocolates and if the child is asked to have only 
uh, 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 five chocolates whole day. If the second child has 10 chocolates in one go, it is the first child who is going to have five chocolates whole day is going to have more chocolates. So meaning it is not the quantity, it is the how frequently the child is going to be having the chocolate is what is going to be deterrent for dental kids. And that device, no chocolate still for years no chocolate still for years i know it is difficult for any mother to follow but unfortunately the child will never ask for the chocolate it is the parents who put the chocolate in the mouth and make them get used to it finally we blame children my child eat too many chocolates so i don't i hate to blame the child is it is the adult and the parent who is responsible if there is a choice indian sweets are more preferable to chocolates why i may not have a logical answer for it but incidentally uh, Indian sweets will have less refined sugar than chocolates. They are less sticky than chocolates. So they tend to remain less time compared to chocolates. Proportionately, they are going to cause less cavities. There are enough studies now. Indian sweets are less cavity causing than chocolates. Uh, one, one practical uh, advice what you can give for the children and the parents is that instead of telling them not to have chocolates, you can let them have chocolates, but let them have chocolates only on a Sunday. By letting the children have chocolates or a sweets on a Sunday or any junk food on Sunday, you're actually having control on the frequency. So we are going to have, we are going to have parents to give choice to the children, whether no chocolates or chocolates on a Sunday. So obviously chocolates on a Sunday is going to be the choice rather than no chocolates. This trick is going to work in, in significant way where you can reduce the frequency of intake of uh, chocolates so that the child is least uh, affected by amount of uh, caries. Yeah, this is about, uh, should we, yeah, the, the, the point is uh, we may not be able to see, as a dentist, I cannot stop eating chocolates. I cannot tell my patients to stop eating chocolates. So instead of letting them have chocolates, put some controls. So frequency is, is more dangerous than the quantity. I'm not asking them to gobble up so many sweets, but frequency is going to be more harmful. Now, the next question is, is the sleep pattern on the posture during breast and bottle feeding can pose a threat as far as dental caries is concerned. Now there are studies which says that the posture of the mother while sleeping, while breastfeeding or bottle feeding is going to be very deterrent, very deterrent in, in, in uh, uh, in, in early childhood dental caries. When I say ECC, I mean early childhood caries. Uh, you can see these pictures where one mother is feeding the child with, with the baby in her arms. The second child is going to be on the bed where the mother would be sleeping, both child also would be sleeping. When this happens after the sixth, eighth or ninth month's time, the child will tend to latch onto the nipple, not for the sake of hunger, they will latch onto the nipple as the comfort. So this results in continuous stream of milk into the mouth. During sleeping, child, child fail to swallow and the unswallowed milk which remains in the mouth will go through the same cycle again, fermentation, dental caries, and ravishing of the teeth. Even when the child is being bottle fed, there is a difference between these two ways. When you have to treat, when you have to feed the child by the first method, the child will get the milk only when you hold the bottle. When you give the child the bottle and let them sleep, this is how it is going to be. Once the child sleeps with the bottle, the bottle is going to be in the mouth for a long period of time and that stream of milk is going to be ravishing the teeth once they get fermented. So whether we breastfeed or bottle feed, it is very important that you feed the baby in such a way that the milk doesn't accumulate and the child is fit for the hunger, not to make them comfortable and make them sleep. This is especially true after sixth month. This may not be an issue before sixth month because there are not going to be any teeth and the fermented the milk in terms of lactic acid will not have any problem on the mucosa, but it is going to have issue on the, on the enamel. Uh, this is one poster, probably it is worth sharing with the parents and this is for both all the caregivers and the parents. This is formulated by International Association of Pediatric Dentistry. Incidentally, I, I, was, uh, I was part of uh, this formulation of this, uh, uh, this declaration. Uh, uh, this Hong Kong Declaration 2018 on Early Childhood Dental Caries has emphasized across the world uh, 
all caregivers, parents, patients, nurses, dentists, pediatricians about four important things. Number one, that is to prevent early childhood dental care because this is a menace. The four key areas is number one, raise the awareness of the early childhood dental care. Is. So a talk like this will make pediatricians more aware of and where you in turn talk with the parents and and we can solve the problem by joining hands. Number two, limit all sugar intakes uh, till two years of age. Do not add any sugar into any food in any, any form till uh, the child is two years. Perform twice daily tooth brushing with the high fluoride toothpaste, as I said, at least twice a day. Provide the first preventive guidance before the age of one year. It is said like this, the first dental checkup should happen before one year and two years will be too late. And this is formulated in 2018. Rainbow Children's Hospital, since 2000, we have included first dental checkup in the vaccination sheet. And mind you, so many parents will come and ask us on pediatricians and dentists, why should you include the dental health care before the truth comes? And we are going to tell about what is the right way of feeding the child, which is the right way of adding sugars, which is not the right way of adding sugars, how to brush the teeth and what kind of a toothpaste we give, and what kind of a checkup should happen, when should the checkup should happen, and how frequently the checkup should happen. All this will be included so that the, this child who is targeted at six months before the tooth comes, if the tooth is examined first, you can literally assure that this child will never go to your dentist for cavities whole life. So half of the dental business is gone. Uh, I was also asked what are the different ways of preventing dental caries apart from, apart from feeding instructions. Uh, uh, one of the ways to prevent dental caries apart from sugar intakes or limitation of sugar intakes and brushing is application of uh, something called fluoride varnish. Now there are two critical areas of the tooth which succumb to dental caries. The smooth surface of the dental caries and the retentive areas of the chewing surfaces. When you have these smooth areas of the dental caries, this is where the milk is going to get accumulated. This is where the tooth is going to lose the calcium. And this is where the initial cavities are going to start, if you remember from the previous pictures. So what a dentist does is we apply something called fluoride varnish, which is an enriched fluoride concentrate on the tooth so that we, we impregnate uh, the fluoride into the tooth so that the enamel will become stronger and stronger. This is on the smooth surface. When it comes to the, uh, the chewing surfaces where we have a lot of retentive areas, if you see these retentive areas here, if you see these retentive areas here, if you see these retentive areas, you can see these you know, pits and fissures. These are the areas when somebody eats sugar, this is where the things will get stuck there. And if you see the second picture here, all these retentive areas are C. This is called pit and fissure sealants. So these are the two important ways of uh, prevention of dental caries in children, apart from limitation of sweets and brushing, which everybody should be aware of. Now, one of the most important thing is the diet. And we talked about chocolates and what are the good things which you need to encourage the children. I don't have to tell good things about the cons and apples, but it has got a specific relevance to dental caries. If any of you would have had any experience about having a chocolate, I'm sure all of you would have had, if we have one piece of guava or apple, that actually makes the whole chocolate disappear from the mouth. So meaning, more chewing you do, it is going to take away all the, all the plaque and the debris which is on the tooth very effectively. In fact, if we can let the child have one piece of guava or one, one half a, a con of a, con it does 50 percent of the brushing it is so effective so encourage children to chew 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 anything what they can chew is chewing you know guava you no know, uh, hard nuts cons all this is going to clean the teeth if the child is encouraged to have one piece of apple or a guava or con at least twice a day you can literally get rid of cavities in the future but it should start very early so they do miracles so encourage children to chew instead of trying to depend on soft food. So this is the crux of the matter. Now, 
going further, we all know the dental caries, and uh, many, many, uh, many clinicians have asked whether the children also need the root canals. Before that, we need to know about the intensity of the dental caries. I may not be able to explain in depth about dental caries. If you see the cavity here, this is an amyloid dentin. As long as the cavity is in an enamel and dentin, we can fill them. But if it goes beyond, if the pulp inside is involved, then that is what is going to be extremely painful. And if it is left untreated, this area will be full of bacteria and this area will get you know, uh, decayed and the bacteria will penetrate out, the noxious material will penetrate out and it is going to affect the permanent tooth inside. It is not only if left untreated, not only that this tooth will be lost and if it is left untreated, this tooth, which is a permanent tooth, which is successor for that, will also get infected. So, yes, children do need the uh, fillings, and if they are not done at the right time, the teeth will get infected, where they end up getting root canal treatments. But mind you, there are enough ways to do root canals without pain. We don't have to worry about pain. So, there are enough ways to treat the teeth with root canals. The purpose of the root canal is basically to retain the tooth in the heart so that they are made to be functional. They are made to be functional. They are going to maintain the space between two teeth maintained so that this tooth, when, the, when there is a transformation or a transition happens, the permanent tooth will occupy that space. So retention of the milk teeth at any cost is going to be a primary importance to retain the function, maintain the teeth in the functional position and make way for the permanent teeth and maintain the aesthetics and the function of the dentition. Now, next question would be, what should you do when the children come with knocked off teeth? And uh, this picture, I'm sure many of you would be aware that the children, when they get teeth knocked off, uh, the teeth can be re-implanted, provided they are re-implanted or attempt to be re-implanted within half an hour to 45 minutes, because you get the best outcome if you can do that within 45 minutes. Milk teeth, uh, re-implantation of the milk teeth uh, usually uh, it, it is tried now and then, but uh, it does not have that kind of a predictable outcome as like in permanent teeth. Once the permanent teeth are knocked out, uh, you ask the parents to clean the tooth under clean water and store it either in water or in milk, or in milk, cold milk, and rush to the nearest dentist. Nearest dentist will be able to re-implant it back and split the tooth like this, split the tooth like this, so that the tooth is again uh, back in the arch without any further uh, uh, damage. So this is one of the successful uh, outcomes, provided we do that within half an hour to 45 minutes. We do implant teeth even after 45 minutes, one hour, but the prognosis or the positive outcome is going to be little less, but we can still try it. We can still try it. So advise all the parents to Preserve the tooth when they are not sure whether it's milk tooth or permanent tooth. Ask them to preserve it in milk. Go to a dentist. Dentist will realize and tell you whether it is the right uh, uh, way to reimplant it, whether it's milk tooth or permanent tooth, and they will uh, uh, logically go ahead and do the procedure. When the teeth are broken down like this, depending on the X-ray findings, we either will go ahead and do the fillings or probably go ahead and do some root canals so that the teeth are preserved in the so for the for the question whether uh, teeth can be reimplanted, yes, teeth can be reimplanted, provided we get it in the right time and the right media. When it comes to other maxillofacial injuries, uh, uh, a good team will will consist of maxillofacial surgeon and a pediatric dentist. The team which has maxillofacial surgeon and a pediatric dentist, when they handle maxillofacial trauma, especially something like leaf heart traumas or zygomatic complex, mandibular fractures, condylar fractures, no doubt that will be best handled by a maxillofacial surgeon when they team up with pediatric dentist. Why? Because the mandible is going to be growing in the future, any damage to the condyle, if it is not handled well, that is going to be hindering the growth of the mandible and the children will end up in ankylosis and uh, micrognathia. So they will not be able to open their mouth forever and the jaw will become smaller, which is called a micrognathia. So any maxillofacial trauma is best handled by a maxillofacial surgeon along with a pediatric dentist. Compared to Earlier days where plastic surgeons used to handle, ENT surgeons used to handle, now the maxillofacial traumatic injuries are best handled by a maxillofacial surgeon. And if it is children, 
they are best handled when the maxillofacial surgeon teams up with the PT attendant. So be on the lookout for the maxillofacial surgeon around your practices so that you can quickly refer these children for appropriate care when they come for maxilla, mandible fractures, caudalar fractures, or zygomatic fractures. Next is when should you be worried about as far as teeth are concerned? Many, many parents would come and bombard the pediatricians about when will my teeth, the child's teeth will come out. Six, is the, six years is the appropriate time for the child to start showing eruption of the teeth. About 60 to 70 percent of children will start erupting teeth by six months of age. But we don't have to be concerned about late eruptions till about 20 months, 12 months after six months. That is still 18 months we don't have to worry about till uh, we don't have to worry about if the parents come with any complaint of uh, uninterrupted teeth. But you should be able to see, if you lift the lip, you should be able to see those swellings on the gum which depict the underlying tooth. If you see the projections and prominences are uh, depicting the incisors, then we don't have to worry about reassure the parents. But if the child do not erupt the teeth, even at 18th month, then we need to be concerned about. Now, the logically, we need to suspect uh, uh, systemic conditions like premature terms, the preterm uh, birth, low birth weight births, nutritional deficiencies, vitamin D, rickets, Down syndrome, hypopituitarism, and uh, so on and so forth, endocrinologists and, uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, genetics will be able to throw a little more uh, light if we have any diet, if we out. When, when it comes to the local factors, there could be a thick mucosal uh, gingival uh, uh, tissue which will not allow the teeth to come out then probably a dentist also would uh, would uh, intervene and uh, attempt uh, to make the teeth uh, come into the mouth but the point is that uh, we need to suspect something if the child do not erupt teeth uh, even after 18th month so this is the answer for when should you be worried about usually this concerns uh, uh, this is usually problem with the primary teeth Usually, once the primary teeth come out, parents usually will not come uh, with so many questions about permanent teeth. They will they will rather go to a, a dentist rather than come to a pediatrician. But when the primary teeth come out, they usually come and uh, uh, you know uh, see the pediatrician for the advice. I don't have to uh, update about uh, the eruption sequences because it is beyond the scope of. Uh, uh, this uh, this uh, this webinar, but it's a, it's a good habit to have a little idea of uh, uh, how to go about because I have seen uh, I have seen many uh, people going wrong with uh, whether it's a permanent tooth or milk tooth when the child comes at eight years and we do get inquiries asking I don't know whether it's a milk tooth or a permanent tooth because uh, at eight years you don't expect the primary incisors to be still there and retained. So it's good to have a little awareness of, about uh, um, you know, uh, eruption status so that you'll also have uh, uh, one yardstick about uh, judging the age of the child also. Uh, one interesting thing about uh, that this issue is uh, neonatal teeth. I'm sure, uh, I'm sure many of us uh, would have had experience uh, with neonatal teeth. The point is, when should you extract them? We used to extract each and every neonatal tooth for a donkey's years, sir. but last one and a half to almost two decades, we stopped doing it. We don't do that because there is no evidence for the child. There is no evidence which says that uh, neonatal teeth are aspirated. You know, there is no evidence for it, and we have not come across any kind of uh, report saying that. So uh, now, when will you take a decision to extract this neonatal teeth? only under these three conditions number one if the mother has difficulty in breastfeeding the child because the nipple of the breast would get uh, you, know, uh, you know ulcerated when the child continuously move the tooth uh, underneath the nipple so it will become so painful for the mother then the mothers will stop will not be able to feed the babies anymore so we should go ahead and extract the tooth any ulcerations on the welter tip of the tongue like like what you see here sometimes it will be so severe that the child will be agonizing uh, with the pain. So if you see any of that kind of an ulcer, we need to go ahead and take a decision to remove the uh, incisor. And the third reason is if the tooth is hanging by thread. So these, that means if the tooth is loosely hanging, if, the, if you start 
touching the tooth and start start moving it the uh, moment the tooth comes out because these teeth do not form in a roots obviously they will be uh, they will be loose but they are not considered as hanging by thread that means if the tooth is completely coming out and if it is hanging by one string of gingiva then we will go ahead and knock it off so neonatal teeth should be removed only when when there's three when we fulfill these one of these three conditions number one mothers having difficulty in feeding alterations in the welter part of the tip of the tongue <clears throat> and if the tooth hanging by the thread and any pediatric dentist will be able to uh, do this extraction and uh, and uh, uh, if the, if the judgment is right uh, even a pediatric surgeon and a pediatrician also can go ahead and uh, extract the tooth but it is best handled by a pediatric dentist now when to intervene uh, uh, when to intervene uh, as far as regular teeth are concerned uh, at, by this point of time usually uh, parents will approach uh, uh, the dentist because now they are aware that the dentist is the person who is going to treat your regular teeth so it is less likely that they may come and ask uh, pediatricians but they can still come back to pediatrician and uh, uh, and ask with a good faith because you have been taking care of this baby for a long time so if they don't mind having your expert opinion and uh, you are expected to give that kind of uh, advice uh, for this children now when to start we need to have a little orientation little understanding about uh, different kinds of malocclusions now if at all something if if at all children comes with irregular teeth these are the three common reasons why children will come with irregular teeth one is skeletal malocclusion where both either maxilla or mandible or disproportionately growing or both maxilla and mandible together growing disproportionately or one of these two jaws are smaller than this is called small uh, skeletal malocclusion if you look at these jaws independently if you look at the upper teeth and lower teeth they are all arranged very well but when they are occluding with each other you will start seeing the disproportionality this is called skeletal malocclusion the second reason is a dental malocclusion where the jaws are very well aligned it is the teeth which are irregular like what you see here this is called dental malocclusion sometimes because of the influences of the functional musculature around the mouth it's a muscle action in terms of uh, you know uh, improper swallowing or mouth breathing uh, like a thumb sucking or tongue thrusting these are all the excessive muscles uh, which are putting forces on the vulnerable teeth once this excessive force falls on the teeth over a period of time teeth will not resist that force they will yield so they will go towards the, against the towards the force where the teeth will get into irregular teeth so the the need of the dental treatment depends on what kind of a malocclusion it, it, it is based on either skeletal malocclusion dental malocclusion or functional malocclusion if it is skeletal malocclusion so we have to handle the bone so sometimes the treatment will be starting as early as 6 years sometimes even 5 years mm -hmm. so that the bone is more malleable you can use so many types of different kinds of braces and clips which we can even disproportionately align bones also can be successfully corrected so this is called uh, this is called a function in a skeletal malocclusion orthodontics now if the teeth are misaligned and they are irregular the teeth can be treated at a different ages depending on the need of the patient and the age of the child and the intensity of the uh, intensity of the malocclusion now the dictum is earlier the best earlier the best now skeletal malocclusions though i said that it can be started very early skeletal malocclusions will be very difficult to treat once the child reaches uh, the pubertal growth spurts so whatever skeletal malocclusion corrections we need to do uh, we need to the skeletal orthodontics we have to do it before the child this uh, achieves puberty so as you all know the girls will reach puberty early boys will reach little early so when we have to handle a child we we prefer to see the child before 10 years and if it is a boy we prefer to see them before 11 years or 12 years again you know it is a general rule not every child will fall in that kind of a category but the earlier the best a pediatric dentist or a dentist should be able to uh, so, uh, realize and uh, he will be able to give you proper advice so uh, one question which i was asked about is when should we attempt uh, stopping thumb sucking habit 
and uh, uh, this is a million dollar question no many parents will come and tell us you know i have i tried applying uh, neem oil some that oil this oil sometimes they are they apply you know a, a diluted uh, chili cream you know that's all ghastly and barbaric the the rule of thumb is that uh, you should understand the suckling reflux usually is is a natural reflux but sometimes it retains beyond certain limit most of the children most of the children about 80 90% of the children will suckle the thumb at some point of time but most of the kids will get rid of it by the time they reach about 6 months or probably one year some children about about 80% about 20% will retain the thumb sucking habit and depending on how intense they suck the thumb how 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 many fingers and at what posture at what level they put the thumb the proportionate malocclusion is going to be resulting the rule of thumb is try not to intervene till the child is about 4 years that is when we have to treat these habits we have to use something of this sort is called habit breaking appliances the child may not make any sense uh, if if we do that before 2 years or 3 years because they always think that it's a punishment they start resisting it 4 4 and a half years is the time where you can make them understand when you tell them that it is good and this is good this is bad they will be able to understand so 4 4 and a half is the right time to intervene to correct uh, Uh, any any habits like uh, thumb sucking habit tongue thrust habit or uh, uh, digit sucking habits or mouth breathing habits so all these habits need to be diagnosed very early so that you don't see any permanent uh, damage which happens long lasting damage i don't say permanent long lasting damage though we can treat it if we can identify this problems we can prevent uh, i'll skip this uh, uh, yeah uh, another question is that uh, should be we worried about discoloration of the teeth now before we ask that question what is the reason for the discoloration is it because of is it because of the plaque which the child is having because of inability of brushing or is it because the stains which are which are for some other reasons or is it because of discol is it discoloration of one single tooth so for example this tooth which has yellowish color of discoloration it is it is because of improper brushing it is because improper brushing this child once you train them or instruct them to brush properly that yellow color will disappear but if the child comes with this kind of a stain these are called the chromogenic stains which sometimes will happen because of certain species of uh, bacteria in the mouth which are normal commissures which after a period of time will disappear though they are unesthetic they are not very harmful such kind of stains can even happen because of iron supplements and sometimes when the child has any kind of uh, uh, non allopathic uh, medications like uh, unani medications certain ayurveda medicines all these things can result in darkish discoloration of the uh, teeth which can be easily removed by cleaning but if it is chromogenic stains because of certain certain species of bacteria they are going to be very stubborn so your dentist will be able to differentiate it with the which is stain which can be treated or not treated and accordingly we can take a decision if the child has one tooth which is discolored like this invariably this is because of some kind of a traumatic exposure to the tooth this tooth must have had some kind of injury in the past where the child and the parent may not remember but this has happened which made the pulp inside the tooth necrotic uh, this is the chromogenic stains which i was talking about uh Uh, going further uh, i quickly want to update you about uh, the stem cells which are present in the tooth we are all aware of uh, stem cells which are available in the umbilical cord which you retrieve during the birthing process and those umbilical cord blood has has hematopoietic stem cells whereas the tooth has something called mesenchymal stem cells they complement each other with this era of uh, research going on about the stem cells and their application in various branches of medicine virtually every branch of medicine are going to be using stem cells in different forms that includes oncology you know endocrinology you know dermatology you know, what not every branch has got some kind of an application so please be aware that uh, the milk teeth which are going to be exfoliating before they exfoliate they do still have little bit of uh, a pulp in them and those pulp 
that pulp will have mesenchymal stem cells and these mesenchymal stem cells can be retrieved and stored so that any 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 ecto mesenchymal originated tissues can be uh, uh, treated when you have any kind of uh, degenerative disorders with uh, these stem cells which are available from the dental pulp finally uh, uh, fear is the big devil in the child we all know how how fearful it is for for all of us to go to a dentist equally the child also will have that kind of a fear going to a dentist now many times it's a big put off for the child to go to a dentist with the fear of a pain many times it is not their experience it is the parental uh, explanation that you know they keep scaring the children if you don't brush your teeth the dentist will pull out a tooth so that kind of a scary words are put onto the child's mind the child will be shit to scared when scared to shit to come to a dentist and uh, these children need to be handled in a different way though pediatric dentists will go through a lot of uh, child psychology training about 30% of the pediatric dentists is about child psychology not exactly dentistry so we very well handle children you know when they keep the mouth open willingly we keep shots in the mouth without uh, any kind of uh, resistance from them and when do have difficult issues when the child is too young or if the child is too uh, having too many problems so we may not be able to see like you know, so this is this is how we behavior manage children sometimes you know we use something called uh, nitrous oxide uh, laughing gas nitrous oxide gas where we make the child inhale the gas through the nose and keep the mouth open so that we can deliver the treatment the nitrous oxide is basically given to make the child comfortable so that they accept uh, treatment without fear and if everything is is not possible we we consider treating these children under a general anesthesia where we consider doing multiple root canals multiple extractions fillings all in one go where the procedure might go about one to one and a half hours but this particular problems can be avoided by proper counseling at the early age when they come to your practices a child who will go through a procedure under dental anesthesia probably on an average will spend anywhere between 30 to 60000 rupees and which is by all means uh, is most expensive uh, uh, for any parent but all these things can be avoided by giving the proper advice uh, at the 6 months of age when they come for well baby checkup when you do dental health so why should a pediatrician should team up with the dentist this is a good reference uh, which everybody should uh, go through academic pediatrics have brought out a one whole issue about uh, uh, about uh, about the oral health about oral health the children's oral health it's a good uh, reference to i'm sure uh, uh, post graduates and dnb residents uh, should should go through this because it is worth reading and uh, across the continents all the national pediatric associations putting lot of effort uh, in in uh, treating and identifying preventing dental conditions uh, so pediatricians should be part of this this is where uh, we would like to team up with the pediatricians so that the best advantage is given to the uh, given to the children and uh, as i said uh, lip the lip lip the lip when the children come for the first dental check up uh, uh, first i mean uh, when they come for uh, uh, um, well baby uh, check ups just lip the lip then you will see the whole story then you will see the whole story you moment to lift the lip you will you will know all sorts of uh, dental conditions so make the parents uh, aware of it sensitize them that the discolored teeth the rotten teeth the caries teeth are not good for the uh, children though they don't even even if they don't have any pain uh, for for I, i my humble request is never tell a child never tell a parent that these are milk teeth they are going to fall off at some point of time you don't have to worry about you don't have brush the teeth because they are milk teeth milk teeth do get cavities milk teeth do become painful when they become painful they will become one hell of a painful teeth they do get infections this is one of the sources for ludwig's angina one of the most uh, life threatening conditions uh, originated from the dental caries so lift the lip and at least make one attempt uh, to make people aware of uh, uh, dental health uh, uh, when they come for first uh, health checkups together uh, when team up with you uh, we can we can when we when, when we join hands together we can become giant healers and i'm sure uh, uh, this uh, little talk uh, would have updated you little more about how to handle children and the parents with the dental issues 
Uh, anything beyond this is beyond the scope of this uh, webinar. Probably I will consider doing some more webinars which are more focused and uh, more worthwhile. And uh, uh, thank you very much for uh, uh, for uh, for uh, for letting me speak on this uh, important issue. And uh, I don't know if we have enough time to answer any questions. Uh, if anybody want to have any questions, probably uh, I can I can see those questions on the chat, and I will see I can I can answer those uh, questions. Uh, I will wait for some time. I will I will you can you can type in your questions in the chat box, uh, uh, and probably I will be able to see if I can answer any of the questions if we still have. If anybody want to talk, probably they can raise their hands. You know how to raise the hand. There is an option which is marked red. You can raise your hand, or probably you can still end up asking questions. I have one question, Neha. When is the ideal age to start brushing? Neha, I think I have answered. Uh, brand name of the pediatric uh, toothpaste. I said the uh, pediatric toothpaste. Once you start using them uh, at the six months of age, I'm. Unfortunately, there are just a couple of brands available. One brand is called Chiku. Uh, the second brand is called uh, what? Uh, some brand, but uh, yeah, yeah. The point is, train the parents to look at those pastes which has no fluoride in them. Causes of bruxism. Yeah, uh, good uh, that uh, I was asked about bruxism. Bruxism is basically because of uh, many reasons. One of the most important reasons, what as a pediatrician you need to know about, is that uh, uh, any kind of discomfort in the body will let the child withhold the discomfort, and they try to show that on the teeth. One of the most common reason is child who holds the urine in the bladder without emptying it. Yeah, the child after some time will have the bladder full. Either they leave it in the bed, or probably they will start holding it by clinching the teeth. Even if the children has any kind of uh, abdominal discomforts because of worm infestations or any kind of issues, will probably uh, result in bruxism. And children who has any kind of stressful experiences, such as you know conflicts at home, conflicts between parents, conflicts between uh, siblings, or any kind of bullying in the school, uh, all those nightmares will result in uh, bruxism. Depending on uh, the situation, the easiest way to treat it is to give something called a night guard or disturb the child's sleep gently so that uh, you 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 make the child uh, stop doing it if that doesn't stop probably a dentist will be able to give a dentist will be able to give uh, a dentist will be able to give a uh, give something called a night guard which will reduce any kind of uh, wearing off of the teeth infant brushing when to start yeah uh, uh, yeah the milk teeth will fall off. Uh, milk teeth will fall off. At, milk teeth will erupt at six months of age. Permanent teeth will start replacing milk teeth at the six years of age, and they can go on till 30 years. When to treat uh, lip ties or probably tongue ties? Uh, yeah, this is one interesting topic. A lot of uh, debate going on nowadays. Uh, th there is one group of uh, clinicians. Uh, both all from pediatricians, pediatric dentists, and dentists and uh, orthodontists who feel that uh, uh, the lip ties uh, do affect the latching of the child's uh, the child uh, to the nipple during breastfeeding, and uh, there is good amount of research is going on, and uh, th there are equal uh, you know number of uh, opinions on either side to do it or don't treat it, but if it is it can be treated. Uh, the best time to treat it, it is to find it as early as possible and uh, the treatment and the cutting off of the lip ties are very simple and uh, easy to do. Market has many toothbrushes. Any good brand toothbrush is fine. There are three kinds of brushes, baby brush, junior brush, and the regular brush. Children who are less than five years will use baby brush. Children who are above five years will use junior brushes. Children who are 10 and they use uh, adult toothbrushes. Any any zigzag, crisscross, any brush is fine as long as it is from the good uh, you know, brand. What is the child's will should uh, switch over to uh, adult toothpaste? Moment the child starts spitting the paste, when you start using with no fluoride, low fluoride toothpaste, if the child starts spitting, 
then you can switch over to adult toothpaste. You don't have to worry about it. Your worry is where the child might swallow. Once the child starts spitting, then there won't be any amount going in. If the child living in the fluoride endemic, yeah, even if the child is coming from the endemic area, the problem is with the fluoride which is in the drinking water, and that drinking water should be from the bore well, not from the river water. Even if the child has any decayed teeth, even if the child is coming from the endemic area, fluoride when it is applied on the tooth is known to have advantage on these children because which is applied on the tooth is not ingested. So it is not going to add any kind of systemic or fluoritic conditions. So it do get, uh, uh, it do give advantage uh, as far as teeth, concern, teeth I mean, uh, cavities are concerned. Instead of giving uh, milk in the night, should we give water? Yes, go ahead and give water. What is cannot be fermented. But as the number of teeth coming after six months, the number of number of feedings in the night should come down. If, uh, want to give the child one to tail? Yeah, uh, we need to find out whether why is the child uh, uh, can can if the child doesn't feed. Yeah, this is a lot of feeding issues. I think. Uh, uh, a, a dietitian should be able to give you how to modify the diet so that uh, you can wean the child in the night after one year. Why not jaggery? See, the problem is jaggery is okay. Jaggery is okay when it is taken in. The problem is when you try to make uh, things uh, sweet with either jaggery, the child's obvious choice always with the sweet food. So parent automatically start adding jaggery. Even jaggery can ferment in the mouth and make the teeth decay. Jaggery could be good in limited amounts, but not when mothers feed them with every meal, telling that jaggery is good. So again, that can also result in cavities. Diastemine infant is desirable. Let me tell you, diastemine milk primary teeth is desirable. That means we don't have to worry about if the child has any kind of gap between primary teeth because a tightly placed well appearing milk teeth uh, without any gaps in fact are the one of the first indicators to to tell you that uh, the child is going to have irregular teeth in the future i think i have i've taken care of most of the questions which i was asked about uh, is it safe to advise the paste after one year absolutely safe we don't have to worry about adult toothpaste adult toothpaste can be used moment the child starts spitting yeah, chemical composition of jaggery and sugar in the sand. That's the point. That's that. that thanks for that. Yeah, I think uh, I think we have taken too long a time. Uh, I think with all your permission, I will I will log out. Uh, I will still be available uh, uh, for any questions. Uh, I will I will type in my email. So I'm I'm always available for any questions. With your permission, I will I will I will uh, end this lecture and. Uh, Thank you very much uh, once again for your patient uh, presence.